All throughout mythology we find stories of extremely powerful weapons made of otherworldly materials, some of which have survived into the modern era for us to study. The truth is that the creators at Marvel most likely based the material known as vibranium, the material used in creating Captain America's shield, on real historical stories and legends of weapons made of metals so strong that it could cut through anything it touches, or magical materials imbued with powers by the ancient gods. These weapons were generally given to heroes by the gods themselves, and said to be created by mythical blacksmiths. These weapons were also won in battle, when defeating demon creatures, or bestowed to heroes who were usually descended from the gods. In these stories, the hero uses the weapon to defeat evil and found great nations, like we find in Japan with the Kusanagi no Tsurugi. China has the myth of the Monkey King staff of Rui Jingu Bong. In Irish folklore as well, we find a story of the legendary magical sword of Fragorok. And in British folklore, we have the story of King Arthur's Excalibur sword, which was forged by the so-called Lady of the Lake and her magical elvish or fairy craftsman. There were also mysterious materials that these weapons were made of. Materials that we still can't explain today, including the Greek writings of the metal used in Atlantis known as orichalcum, or the dwarven steel of the Norse gods that came from the heavens, or the Damascus steel swords created by the Islamic craftsmen that were said to be so strong they were capable of slicing through normal steel blades. The first of these, orichalcum, is a metal we know very little about. It was briefly mentioned by Plato in his works of Critias and Timaeus, where he describes it as a part of the Atlantean wealth. Several other Greek writers speak of orichalcum in their works, including Pseudo-Aristotle and Hesiod, but it's never more than a brief mention that gives us no further details on its makeup or properties. What we do know about it is that it was spoken in the same breath as gold, and was very important to the Atlanteans, and associated with Poseidon's trident, and his power as one of the chief Greek gods. Plato wrote, The three outer walls of the temple to Poseidon and Clato on Atlantis were clad respectively with brass, tin, and the third which encompassed the whole citadel flashed with the red light of orichalcum. The interior walls, pillars, and floors of the temple were completely covered in orichalcum, and the roof was variegated with gold, silver, and orichalcum. In the center of the temple stood a pillar of orichalcum, on which the laws of Poseidon and the records of the first sun princes of Poseidon were inscribed. And then there are several other Greek myths which mention the metal as well. One of which is the myth of Cadmus, who was the Phoenician founder of the Greek city-state of Thebes. In some versions of the story, it mentions Cadmus being gifted the rare metal orichalcum by the goddess Athena after he slayed a great dragon. No further mention is made of orichalcum, but Cadmus went on to assist the famous Greek demigod Perseus, who slayed the Gorgon Medusa. And in some myths, he even wielded the sword that Perseus used to slay Medusa, the harp sword, which was made of divine materials also gifted from Athena. I think there could be a connection there. And this orichalcum metal could have given its user divine abilities. In later Roman mythology, there's a story that mentions this rare metal as well. In Virgil's Aeneid, it was mentioned that the breastplate of Turnus was, quote, stiff with gold and white orichalc that Aegis of Turnus is depicted as a fearsome and formidable piece of armor. It's described as being adorned with a variety of fierce and intimidating images, including gorgons, serpents, and representations of the god Mars, or Ares in Greek, whom Turnus revered. The Aegis is also said to have been crafted with the skin of a slain giant, which added to its menacing appearance. The breastplate plays a symbolic role in the Aeneid and reflects Turnus's status as a warrior and leader. It serves as a visual representation of his valor and power and determination on the battlefield. However, despite the impressive nature of his armor, Turnus ultimately meets his fate in the final duel with Aeneas, who emerges victorious and fulfills his destiny as the founder of Rome. Orichalcum is also mentioned in the Antiquities of the Jews, 1st century AD. Book 8, section 88 by Josephus, who stated that the vessels in the Temple of Solomon were made of orichalcum, or bronze that was like gold in beauty. Other than these, we have no details about this mysterious divine metal in Greek mythology. There's also a reference to a substance called adamas, or adamant, which was believed to be the hardest material known. It's often associated with the gods and used to describe their impenetrable armor, or the chains used to bind mythical creatures. The ancient Greek poet Hesiod mentions adamantine in his works 
such as in the Theogony and the works of days. He mentions adamantine in the context of describing the armor or attributes of the gods. He writes, From the beginning there were the immortals, who held Olympus and Zeus, who dwells in the sky, their chief. And he, the son of Kronos, made for them houses and gave them a place of refuge. He placed in their possession the great city of the holy gods, and each of them was fashioned by the hands of the famous Cyclopses, and each had a hundred hands growing from his shoulders. They were born from the womb of the earth, by the will of the sky, with adamantine heart within. This one's from Hesiod's Works and Days, lines 176 to 183. For on earth the gods have placed toil, ever as a trusty mate for mortals, in order that the sluggish man might be hindered from his work and might not overcome his poverty, but that the swift in pursuit of wealth might achieve what his heart desires. But since you are unwilling to cease from your labor and toil unremittingly, on a second day a man will bring you an adze of sharpened bronze, and on a third day he will bring you an adamantine drill to turn with your hands. Here Hesiod mentions an adamantine drill as a tool used by humans. It signifies a strong and durable tool, reinforcing the idea of perseverance and industriousness. While Hesiod is one of the notable ancient Greek poets who mentions adamantine, there are a few other references to adamantine or similar concepts in Greek literature. Here are a couple more examples. In the Iliad by Homer, book 18, line 478 to 480. In this passage, the poet Homer describes the arm of Achilles, which was forged by the god Hephaestus. Then he took up the shield, all glittering. No one ever broke it with a blow or crushed it. And there Hephaestus, the famous lame god, had skillfully crafted a hundred of these shields, all of bronze, all impregnable. Neither fire nor point nor edge could pierce them. From the center of the shield, like a sun, there rose a boss of steel, adamant indeed, with twenty radiating circles, and on each circle a shield of bronze, dark blue. In this description, the center of Achilles' shield contains a boss of steel described as adamant indeed, signifying its impregnability and strength. Ovid, a Roman poet influenced by Greek mythology, mentions adamantine in one of his works. In this passage, Ovid tells a story of Perseus and describes the head of the Gorgon Medusa. The gaze of her eye he stiffens, the living blood congeals on his veins, to solid adamantine ice has transformed the rapture of life. Alright, the next candidate for the real life vibranium is what's known as dwarf steel in North mythology. The story of how Thor's hammer known as Mjolnir was made is recounted in the Prose Edda, a collection of Old Norse myths and legend compiled by the Icelandic scholar Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century. According to the myth, the hammer was created under extraordinary circumstances. The story begins when Loki, the mischievous Norse god, played a trick on Thor by cutting off the golden hair of Thor's wife, Sif. Enraged by Loki's prank, Thor threatened to harm him unless he found a way to replace Sif's hair. Loki agreed and set up to Svartalfheim, the realm of the dwarves. In Svartalfheim, Loki sought out the skilled dwarven craftsmen known as the Sons of Ivaldi. He persuaded them to create new hair for Sif and to forge other remarkable gifts for the gods. The sons of Ivaldi crafted Sif's hair from gold, made other magnificent treasures including a magical ship and Gunnir, Odin's spear. However, Loki wasn't satisfied with the gifts alone. He then approached the dwarf Broker and challenged him to create an even more remarkable item. Broker agreed and started working on the powerful weapon, Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Mjolnir possessed several extraordinary qualities. It was described as unbreakable, and capable of returning to Thor's hand after being thrown. Hammer also had a power of summoning lightning and thunder, making it a symbol of Thor's might and authority as the god of thunder. In some versions of the story, Thor's hammer is forged of a divine metal known as Uru. This metal was said to come from the heavens, and was more powerful and strong than any metal on earth. The dwarves were believed to possess knowledge of secret metals or special alloys that granted their creations unique properties. These metals were often described as being incredibly strong, durable, and imbued with magical qualities. They used these metals to create things for the gods like Odin's ring and the magical bindings of Fenrir. But there are no descriptions of what exactly these metals were or what gave them their magical abilities. 
seems the metals themselves had powers residing in them, because the gods in this case were not the ones to bestow them with the power, but the dwarves were. And our final super-powered metal in history is the famous Damascus steel of the Middle East. Used as early as 900 AD, the metal was said to be stronger than any other steel in the world at the time, and was written as being able to slice through rock, as well as other blades. The steel used in making these swords was said to have special qualities making it unique from other steels. It was mined in South India and shipped to Syria, where master craftsmen performed science that was thousands of years ahead of its time. The sorbs are described as super plastic and extremely hard, and they had an exceptionally high carbon content due to the plant biomass that was added during the process. Somehow using some sort of technique unknown to us now, these blacksmiths created 17 nanowires and carbon nanotubes in the steel of the blades. These are tiny thin layers of 17 in carbon, no thicker than a few atoms. These are essentially layers of what we today refer to as graphene which is a super thin, super hard substance made of pure carbon that was only just discovered in 2004. And yet over a thousand years ago, they were incorporating it into sword production in Syria. And by the way, this method has been attempted by scientists and master smiths today, but no one can successfully replicate the hardness of the original Damascus swords containing nano layers of carbon and cementin. All right, that's all for today. I hope you found some of these metals interesting. If you want to read more into this or any other topics we cover, I've been posting all the articles, videos, and books that I consume while researching for all these videos to my Patreon. I'll put that link below. Thank you for watching. See you again later.